been very excited today to have uh, our friend Max Martin uh, here uh, as our speaker. I've uh, known Max for quite a number of years. In fact, we were just chatting about this. You know, eight or 10 years ago, we were doing a series of Southern Soil Health Conferences is what we were calling it. And Max was one of our speakers uh, at one of our conferences that we did in Ardmore, Oklahoma. Uh, it did such a great job that I've always thought, gosh, we need to get that guy back back in front of people again because Max is really unique. He has a really unique background. And so not only is he a rancher in Loving, Texas, uh, they run, I think, 500 feeder calves out there uh, on the pastures that they have, pastures and fields in Loving, Texas. But he's also got a deep background in software development. So uh, he started a software company back in 1980. Uh, which is really early for software development. So he was in on the very ground floors of that. Uh, and so he has a, a very analytical mind that he brings to the ranching industry as well, which I think is good because it helps him to look at things just a little bit differently. Again, it's not a right or wrong perspective. Uh, other people's backgrounds just give you different perspectives, but it is unique. And And I really like people with unique perspectives because I think it's, really easy for us to learn from someone who has a different background than us. So uh, hopefully we can all pick up some of the, the uh, software mindset that Max brings to not only the ranching industry, but also the pursuit of soil health, uh, because that has been a big passion of his from the very beginning. How can we raise these animals? And at the same time, how can we improve and regenerate the soil that, you know, that He's been blessed with down there in that area. So again, Max brings that uh, that that unique perspective of the software development. Uh, his company develops uh, software fraud prevention software and other things for the financial and behavioral health industries. So it's not even related to agriculture, but that the the analytical mindset will apply to all of these different sectors. So again, I'm excited to hear him bring that perspective to the ranch, to soil health, to regenerative agriculture, and how he's using that. So, uh, Max, with that, I think I am going to hide myself off screen here. Uh, we'll turn it over to you. Uh, go ahead and, and kind of do your presentation, and then I'll jump back on, and, and we'll start the conversation. And then, folks, please, as you get questions, as Max says something, you got a question, you'd like to follow up on that, you don't have to wait, pop it right in the chat, pop it in the Q&A box, and we'll be getting to those questions uh, uh, after the presentation. So, Max, take it away. Thank you, Keith, very much. I'll run through our decade of trying to put together a best model, a model that improves our ranch assets and creates sustainable cash flow and profitability for our cattle operation. And I'd like to share that model with you all so that you can understand what issues uh, we ran across because when we started 11 years ago, we had issues. Uh, we found solutions and we've created opportunities. I'll share with you what I've learned because what works is a whole lot better than what doesn't. So the objective today is to discuss how I have integrated no-till, cover crops, and cattle so that we can have your operation be successful and you can perhaps prevent some of the failures uh, that, that I've had. At the uh, ranch, we run about 540 mama cows. Most of them are blacks, reds, and baldies. And our bulls are Charlet bulls with the top 15% of EPDs, and those are, we're talking about terminal uh, EPDs for the carcass and for gains. So you can see right there, uh, one of the aspects, cornerstones of our model is cross Charlet with Angus. So we get an F1 cross, which gives us about a 40 pound lift uh, right off the bat. We run full cow calf as well as feeder operations, and we try to take that calf up to about 900 pounds. One of the other foundations we have is both fall and spring calving, and I'll get into that in a little more detail. And uh, we have 11 years of history of no-till that I'll share with you today. The 
the principles that we deploy in our uh, feeder calf uh, operation, you know, you kind of have to start with saying, well, what's ranching all about? And for us, ranching is about animal reproduction and grass. It's pretty simple. Underneath that, we've got to have water. And we've got a, a watershed management program that we work on uh, arduously every year. And underneath that is soil health, because we've got to have soil to produce those forages. So the first thing we focus on is animal reproduction. We obviously have got to have a high breed up. We also want to insert genetics into that calf. We do that by ensuring that mama has good nutrition throughout her trimester, three trimesters of carrying that calf. We want a very rigorous disease immunization program. Now I use the word disease immunization versus vaccination because there's a big difference. We monitor daily, if not weekly, uh, that body condition on that cow because in our climate with our moisture, that's very, very difficult to ever catch up if you get that body condition behind. The second foundation for our model is forage production. We want a lot of species and we want it to have 12 month availability to our stocker cattle. It will go through how we're accomplishing that. The third pillar is watershed management. An industry in an area where we get only 22 inches a year, we want to capture water, we want to retain it, we want to stop erosion. So we've got a significant amount of our capital in watershed management. And all that is meaningless if you don't have the soil to produce those forages. So that's the bottom line of our, of, of our model. There in the pictures, you can see some of our feedlot operation. And of course we have, we're in country with mesquite and a lot of brush. So we have an extensive brush management and pasture renovation program. And I'll get into a little bit of that later on. We try to produce a 900 pound calf, a calf that the feedlots want to buy. What do they want? They want carcass, they want gain, they want disease immunity. So here's how we execute these principles. A feedlot, we want gain. We want a calf that gains a lot of pounds. That's why we want to interject those terminal EPDs for our bulls into that calf. We're looking for gains. We're looking for carcass uh, dressability. <laughs> and those are the things that the feedlots want. We're looking for a lot of disease immunity. For example, we do mineral analysis on of our forage and our pastures. We then have a company develop a custom mineral vitamin mix for us so we can get that calf on a good start on immunization. And then we follow that up with a very timely VAC45 uh, protocol of vaccinations. When we sell that calf, we want that calf to be part of a truckload that's very uniform because those feedlots have got to have a tight tolerance on uniformity. So we use on ranch scales. We measure frequently those calves and try to keep them together. We use a very strict 60 day breeding season and we double sort those calves before load out in the sense that uh, we've learned that if you take those calves into Oklahoma City, which is where we sell our calves and you have much of a variance that that, uh, that auction house OKC has to separate those calves out and sell them at a discount, that hurts. We watch those uh, auctions as you do, and uh, sometimes those auctioneers on a small unit just don't spend enough time, and the buyers don't want a small unit of four or five calves. So those discounts really sometimes get pretty heavy. The other thing we want from our profitability program is we want a low cost of gain for that calf. And we use uh, three methods for that. During our winter, you, we use triticale, in the summertime, we use cover crops, and I'll also speak about how we use Klein grass as a transition, and particularly in those years where we don't have enough uh, water. We chose triticale because when you look at the stem to leaf ratio, it's much better uh, than, than wheat.
So here's a picture across the year of our forage, because this is the main driver for our cattle uh, operation. So I mentioned we calve twice a year. So we have a summer crop, a cover crop that supports half of that herd, and then a winter crop where we graze the other half of that herd. So cover crop is a big deal for us because it gives us forage in the summer that we wouldn't nor normally have here in North Central Texas. At our farm feedlot operation, we also have a transition forage which we use 100% Klein grass for. And we like that because if our cover crop gets short on water and our winter trade Achille hasn't quite started up, we've got a backup where we can put those calves on Klein grass while we're waiting on that trade Achille to get to uh, a production stage where we can uh, graze those, those calves. So we calve in uh, May and September it gives us our forage ready at alignment for July and May. Uh, we've got those bull economics going into that because with high genetics bulls, I pay more at, a, at our bull sales for our bulls because those bulls are about 15, or top 15% of the AICA database. So we pay a premium for those bulls, but we use them twice a year. A bull will last us about six years. So if you do the math, we have a bull cost of about $19 per calf. So we get better genetics and a cheaper calf way. The other thing we like about two seasons, the calving is it gives you a better program on managing your opens. So when a cow pulls up open, we give her a different color tag and we move her back one cycle. If she comes up open the second time, then uh, we load her out on the trailer and get rid of her in the herd because she's not going to breed up to meet our standards. The other thing we like about two season calving is it balances our labor uh, through the year. So here's what a typical July looks like for us when the rest of North Texas is out there uh, with their high horsepower tractors doing uh, tillage. We're starting to graze our cover crops. This is what our cover crop looks like in early July. And at the same time, that's when we typically start our watershed management uh, program, whether we're building new tanks or cleaning them out or building spreader dams. Uh, and also in July, we take a look and start ground training our colts for the year. Currently, we've got uh, the two acre uh, tank that we're building, a one acre tank and four check dams on a creek that we've already started for this, uh, this summer. Here's a picture of what that cover crop looks like in early August. Uh, this picture is worth a thousand words for you. You can see it's pretty intense. I'm sitting on an ATV with this picture and you can see it's over my head. You can see some millets. Uh, we really like all the millets in our mix. Uh, this picture happens to be a couple years old and you can also see some hemp. Uh, and uh, I've got a uh, hemp story to tell you that's perhaps our biggest disaster and biggest catastrophe. And when we started, uh, we'd go out in the summertime and we'd look and uh, be very proud of all of our hemp. And the following year, uh, we decided we needed a lot of hay, so we wanted to bale a lot of our uh, hay in between uh, mowing, raking, our tractors to run balers on our balers. We had 14 flat tires because we had a great year for hemp. And that hemp stalk uh, was about as big as round as your finger and hard as the 16 penny nail because it hasn't it had much decomposing. So uh, there is my love, hate relationship with, uh, with hemp. Okay, here's a picture. Well, what do we, what do we see here in late August? Well, this is where the magic happens for cover crops. What you see here is a component of cover crops, which makes that magic. Look at the canopy because those leaves, you'll begin to see in a few minutes that weed management was our number one issue when we went into a no-till. That canopy is a big weed management tool. You can begin to see at stem a huge amount of biomass, tremendous root structure that we've got. So we like very much uh, these cover crops because of what they give you in the way of animal protein, 
in the way of weed management, in the way of root structure, in the way of biomass. So there is a lot of contribution that this simple plant is giving us throughout the year. This is a summer picture. Here's a winter picture, canola and some radish. Again, big root structures. And of course, we've got plenty of biomass for our triticale, uh, so we don't so much depend on uh, these things in the winter time, but we're gonna talk about root, uh, roots and soil compaction. So we're looking for roots. In this particular case, I uh, add canola and radish to our, to our mix, which gives us a big uh, impact there. We can achieve so much with our cover crops. So the criteria that we use for our mix is one of the most important things we do in the year. And as Keith can tell you, I'm very particular about the kind of mix we want because we have a tremendous criteria on grazing. So we want protein, but we also want plant diversity. I also want root structure for soil health and, and soil organic matter. And I also want weed management. So I kind of want it all in our criteria. And this slide shows a list of criteria that's important for us to consider uh, when we select that, uh, that mix. We've got root structures. We've got weed, weed suppression. We've got biomass. As I mentioned with hemp, decomposition rate is an important thing we want to control. Certainly with our moisture conditions on an off hit and miss, we want to know about hardiness and germination. We also want to know about post-grazing regrowth. If we can get that plant to regrow after it has been grazed the first time, that's a, that's a good thing for our protein element. So we've learned there's a huge upside for the right mix. And having uh, that, we're still experimenting. We still don't think we know not the perfect mix. I mentioned to you that weed management was probably our number one issue when we went into no-till. So uh, here's a little bit more information on how we do our weed management. Because today, other than Johnson grass, we really have kind of conquered a good weeds management program. The cheapest and best is to use cattle. And we use that when we can to manage our or, uh, weeds. The second thing is the species itself. <clears throat> and the blowout on the orange uh, list I've here had here is some things I want to talk about. Because cover crop has a tremendous direct competition with the weed, which is important. I happen to think more of the allopathic uh, capabilities uh, of that species because I think year a year we're seeing that to be more and more important. While there's a lot of scientific publications out there about these allopathic chemicals, uh, I wish there were more. But we know certain species have higher allopathic traits and properties th than others. Uh, but for example, in our own anecdotal uh, research, when we drive around on ATVs, we never see a weed within 10 inches of a sunflower. And the same with our sorghums. So I think there is more to the allopathic nature of cover crops. Um, we're seeing that every year. Uh, certainly, uh, cover crops give us microbial resistance to weeds. And the residue of the biomass is certainly an insulator that prevents weeds from being germinated. We also depend on a broadleaf mix because we think it gives us a good vegetative canopy. So there's all of the tools, uh, albeit some complex more than others, that we use for weed management to solve that biggest issue uh, that, that we've had. Now let's speak about some other issues that we've had that have difficulty. Uh, we've got uh, about 20,000 hooves out there on that cover crop or triticale with those cattle stomping on that every every day, every hour of the day. So it's a big issue, but ironically enough, it's an issue that's simple to solve. It takes roots, it takes a lot of roots, and it takes 12 months worth of roots. 
and that has solved that problem pretty easy. We mix one pound of turnips and one pound of rapeseed into our triticale when we load our a drill every year. Just that simple mix gives us 380,000 roots per acre or 78 roots per yard. That's a lot of roots that offset that soil compaction. And of course, our summer crops are heavy root producers as well. So we have 12 months of active roots into that soil, and that has solved that problem pretty well. Another issue is prosomic acid and how do we prevent bloat on our cattle. And here's the way that we've solved that. We keep legumes fairly low, ratio to grass, grass is high, and we hold off on any grazing on those sorghums until they're about 20 inches high. And we religiously, of course, use bloat block. To give you a little bit of an idea, this year we've run 500 head. We know that we've had one problem with bloat that happened to be uh, when we were on site, we caught the heifer, put her in a pen for two days, and uh, was not a problem. Uh, we caught it, but uh, it is it can be a big, a big problem. As far as the mix is concerned, here's kind of a base mix that I kind of like. As far as balancing out all four sectors of species. We use about 20% legumes. We like that very much, usually from a nitrogen producing uh, point of view, as well as a good canopy for weed management. Naturally, I'm biased in my criteria for protein, so we really like grasses. We like sorghums. We like millets. Uh, that gives us a lot of regrowth also, gives us a lot of protein. So we're running this year about 60% on that category. I like broadleaves, I like buckwheat, because buckwheat is known to have high allopathic characteristics for weed management, as do sunflowers. I also like ochre. Ochre's got a good biomass, got a good canopy, so we get a lot of mileage out of our broadleaves, not only for protein, but for weed management. And brassicas give us the roots that we want, so we like brassicas as well. Okay, let's shift a little bit of the conversation to how do we know if we're succeeding or not? We've been in this game for 10 years and we know we're succeeding. So let me run through the five measurements that we have learned to use. We didn't always know this, uh, but now we know how to measure success across all of our dimensions of our program. Of course, for me, the first thing is cattle and we want to know that cost of gain. And I'll go through some of the cost of gains in a minute that we find in out our cover crop. So that's the most important criteria that we used. As we started out 11 years ago, if you would have told me that one of our main metrics was soil organic matter, I would have said something like, what? Why is that so? Well, we found that measuring soil organic matter is probably one of the most important measurements that we have. We did very simple. Uh, cheap cost or cheap, but not cost effective uh, soil test. When we started out, uh, we learned that that was insufficient. We've moved to a more advanced soil testing. We use the Haney soil test, which we think a lot of. We measure our own water filtration on the ranch. And of course, throughout the ranch, we're constantly measuring our water retention. Uh, so those are the five elements that uh, we measure consistently to know if we're succeeding or not. I mentioned soil organic matter. Uh, every year, we're learning to appreciate soil organic matter even more than we did last year because it's the everything dimension of our program. It's a storehouse for nutrition. It improves the soil structure, and it drives so many of the factors. It stabilizes pH, and we had a, a pH problem uh, when we were prior to no-till. Uh, we did not have good control of our pH, and we tried to achieve pH control through artificial means only to find out that it was short term. Naturally, when we studied that, the only long term uh, metric that you have to control pH is soil organic matter. We haven't had pH problems uh, since. You can see here 
the impact of a 1% uh, increase in SOM. I'll show you what our SOM here is, is in a few minutes. We've made tremendous uh, strides in that area. So we've learned that it's been easy to monetize the soil organic matter into the point where we now review it as one of our major capital assets of our entire ranch. I mentioned to you the Haney test that we've gone to. Uh, this will give you some of the results of this year's uh, Haney test for us. And keep in mind, we've been in operation for only 11 years uh, with no-till and cover crops. First thing we want to measure is soil respiration because those microbial activities and bacteria, they need breathing just like human beings. Haney measures that on a scale from zero to a thousand. We're setting this year to 474. We've made tremendous strides in this area. You can see there over on the right side of the slides, Haney's comment, and they, they seldom see that above 200. So we're very pleased with the respiration that we've had, which improves that soil microbial activity, which keeps that going on the, the nutrient cycle. You can see there are nitrogen in the next three areas. We're producing a lot of nitrogen. We're producing about 15 pounds of nitrogen per acre out of that nutrient cycle. At the end, uh, Haney has a summary soil health <clears throat> metric. The zero to 50, we're sitting at a 33. Their comment is uh, very seldom do their soils exceed 30. Our soil infiltration is running about 1.5. <clears throat> Inches an hour, <clears throat> that's moderate. I wish we had wish we had more of that. Now let's turn to a little bit on the monetization of all this. Uh, how does all this affect the bottom line? Well, we like you are in the commodity revenue side business, so your most important element is on your cost side. The two calving seasons is a huge factor for us gives us a better alignment to forage, low cost of gain, gives us better economics of our bulls, so we get a better bull at a cheaper price. We love triticale in the winter. It's a good hay producer, and it's uh, the, the leaf uh, dimension of the triticale is very good for grazing point of view. We've gone through the summer crops, that's a big deal for us. No-till's been a big deal for us although it has taken a big adjustment to get used to it. <clears throat> and we try whenever we can to reduce our herbicide costs uh, through either no termination, uh, which sometimes gets a little risky, or through termination with cattle. So the payback factors that we've experienced is we have achieved the low cost of gain we want for our feeder cattle operation. We've lowered our horsepower equipment costs uh, and reduced capital that we need. <clears throat> we spend less time in the field. We have less diesel fall cost, although we do uh, admittedly have an offsetting herbicide cost. And we have much better soil health. So the next question that you're going to ask is in a cattle operation, how do we monetize cover crops? Keith loves his slide. We paid Keith this year $16,000 for seed. That seed has given us, or will give us, three months of grazing for about 220, 250 head of feeder cattle. After we put them on a 45 day grain operation in the feedlot. So you can see the math that we have with our gains, with our cattle and our amount of beef produced and of course, with today's $2.50 price, you're going to rack up an improved revenue of $123,000 with a $16,000 cost. We've got a little cost in putting the grain in, but not a whole lot. So you can see you've got a pretty whopping three-digit ROI that that cover crop gives you. So your cover crop payback is huge. Cover crop for for, for uh, grain for grazing for, can be monetized and dimension of that cover crop for soil quality. So I couldn't be more of a uh, high class user of cover crop. We love it. We did learn a lot of lessons. So if I can help you with lessons learned to shorten your pain, uh, we would certainly like to do that. 
Weed management has been and is a continuing operation. We've been successful using uh, cattle for that. Uh, when we started, quite frankly, I couldn't identify weeds very well. We can maybe identify 20 of the weeds we had to manage, but no more. I couldn't tell you the germination times of that weed throughout the year. So that's been a learning and education step for us. We now know germinations. We can now spot those weeds, and we now know when the best time to manage them is. We were not students of herbicide and herbicide groups. Uh, now we are. We know when to use them, when to rotate them out. Soil health monitoring. Uh, we thought we were making success, and quite frankly, uh, we were measuring. Uh, we were we measured more success over ten years than we'd really thought. We know the fertility levels that we're getting out of out of that uh, soil. We understand the importance of soil structure. Uh, I speak very highly of Ward Laboratory and their handy management testing method. That's been very successful for us as an indicator. We very much like the species and the variety of uh, cover seeds that we're getting from Keith in the balance of legumes and brassicas and grasses uh, because we know we have antagonistic goals. On one hand, I want to consume that plant with high protein with cattle. On the other hand, I want to preserve that, preserve that biomass uh, for, our, for our soil program. And for forage uh, termination, we have a lot of grasses, so it's very difficult for us to manage with a physical structure, a roller. So we try to use cattle and graze that out, but sometimes the rain allows us to get ahead of that uh, going into sowing triticale. So we do have to use glyphosate and 2,4-D to, um, to terminate uh, that uh, crop. So we like the profitability of this program. It works. No-till works. Cover crops works. Integrating cattle with two cycles, uh, that works. So it's been a very good program for us. No-till does require some adjustments, uh, but the benefits in uh, no-till have been very good for us. Cover crops is just a plain no-brainer for us. As far as where I'm headed, obviously with $2.60 uh, cattle futures this morning, we like our cattle program. We're going to continue to experiment with, with cover crop species. We're currently soaking, sowing about 29, 30 pounds an acre. We're going to try to ramp that up to 40, knowing that sometimes our summer rains won't support that. <clears throat> but we really like the effects we're getting. Uh, we're continuing to have to work on weed management. We like the soil uh, results that we're getting. As far as watershed management, that's perhaps the biggest area of the ranch that we're improving our assets. We've got a good clay base. Uh, we got plenty of opportunity across 13,000 acres to uh, retain our water. So we hope this blueprint has been helpful for you in helping you achieve and fulfill your objectives uh, because you and I are the stewards for America's soil tomorrow. Thank you, Keith, and I'll turn it back over to you for questions that you may have. Yeah, great. Thank you, Max. Uh, I love that last comment, especially about how, you know, we are the stewards uh, of this soil, of this land for, you know, for future generations. And, and I think that's why you're a, a great customer of, of ours, because, you know, our mission statement here at Green Cover is to help people regenerate, steward, and share God's creation for future generations. And that's exactly what you're doing and and the changes that you've made on your ranch is, is stunning you know I, I mean we we have pretty good soil here in nebraska and and we would love to have four percent organic matter in a 30 plus soil health score on the haney test and you know a, a respiration of 474 i mean those are those are incredible numbers particularly for the environment that you're in down there and and uh you know, kind of West Texas or West Central Texas anyway for uh, limited rainfall. So hats off to you. Great job of, of what you've done. Um, yeah, I've got I've got uh, three pages of notes here. So I'm going to ask a, a few starting questions and then we've got 
Uh, we've got questions coming in to the uh, Q&A box here as well. So folks continue to put those in. Uh, so Max, when you turn out, uh, you got 250, you know, head of stalkers in, in a group. Are you rotationally grazing those in, you know, small paddocks and then moving every day? Are you doing every week moves? What does what your stocking rate versus moving look like? Well, you know, we don't have the small paddocks down here in Texas. I mean, the fence costs would, would drive me crazy. Uh, the other thing, of course, is, is labor. Uh, we have basically four fields uh, that we can rotate those 250 head with. Yes, we rotate them. And of course, we rotate them with respect to various times of the year because I'm preparing for that triticale. So naturally, I'm going to rotate and try to graze down as much as I can, which saves me seven to $10,000 of herbicides. Uh, and of course, sometimes I don't have the rain uh, to, to graze them. But yes, we try to rotate and we can down to maybe 50% of that stock and then we try to move them on. Okay. And so when, when you talk about the cover crops and the triticale, are all of your cropped fields getting that every year or do you have different fields that you do one or the other and you kind of rotate around that way? No, we, we plant every field every year in triticale and every field every year in cover crop. Okay. And, and again, in a 22 inch rainfall average, which means some years you're 10 and some years you're 40 probably to, to get that, that's, that's impressive to essentially be double cropping. Is that pretty rare for your area or most people just kind of doing the one crop a year? No, it's very rare. We have a few no-tillers around but they don't do uh, cover crops and uh, so so they don't now you know our problem is not only 22 inches of rain but it's when we get it because we get it in april and may and then we get it in september and october so sometimes you know i'm stranded in the summertime and that's why i've got that third backup of of uh, klein grass and of course we like a hundred percent klein grass in our feedlot farm operation, whereas in our pasture, I'd like, I like that to be more cast throughout the year. So we use about 60% uh, klein grass in our pastures when we renovate them and 40% native so that I can have a longer duration of that. Yeah, yeah. And so by doing the two plantings a year, you're spreading out that capital cost. It's very much like doing two cabins a year. You're spreading out that bull cost. You're spreading your land costs out across two different grazing seasons and not just one, like many of your neighbors would be. Yes, and that also gives me a bright product that I can enter those calves in a little bit more diverse market price. So if the market price happens to be down one side of the, side of the year, at least I've got the other side of the, side of the year to send the calves and hopefully get a little better price. So it gives me more market diversity. Right. Not to mention balancing your labor out like you were talking about too. So yeah, no, that all, that all makes uh, a huge amount of sense, you know, from a financial standpoint. Um, also wanted to just double check. You never mentioned fertilizer. I assume you're not, are you putting any fertility inputs into this at all once you got the system rolling? Well, one of the big things we've had from an advantage of, of no-till and cover crops is that nitrogen intake. So we're starting to get our own self-regulatory nitrogen cycle going. So no, I don't really put much on there. Now, sometimes in February, if we don't have the rains, uh, I will put on liquid, liquid nitrogen. We've got our own uh, applicator. And of course, one of the things that we also do in February is that's when we get rid of those mares tails because our biggest weed problem is mares tail and of course if you don't get that during that uh cycle as you put nitrogen on on the, that triticale uh it's very difficult to weed and control as, as all the readers know yeah so by doing the grass only then you can use your broadleaf herbicides in that window yeah that yes makes sense Speaking of weed control, you mentioned that Johnson grass is one you're still trying to get a handle on. And I know that, you know, we're far enough north here in Nebraska, we don't really deal with Johnson grass, but I 
hear from lots of people that have it. It is a real booger to try to control. What What are some of the things that you, and you probably never eliminate it, but you can kind of manage it and control it? You know, of, of the different things that you listed there, you know, with crop canopy and, and cattle and, and all those other things, what have you found to be most effective in trying to at least, you know, keep Johnson grass manageable? Well, cattle is, a, is the biggest one. Of course, there you got also watch, you know, prussic acid. Uh, so when it's drought, a heavy drought, you have a little bit of problem. Otherwise, we try to put cattle out there and we'll quick graze that. Uh, they like to eat the uh, the leaf, but they don't try to eat the seeds so much. So while cattle helps, it doesn't uh, solve it. Clothanium uh, herbicide is used. I don't particularly have great success at it. Uh, glyphosate is not effective at all uh, from a long-term point of view uh, on it at all. Sometimes uh, if we've got a little availability of labor, uh, in July, we'll actually take a mower out there and try to mow some of it in the heaviest areas. But it's problematic. There's no question. Yeah, and, and so that's why, again, as a good manager, you just you have to be prepared because the timing of that is going to be a little different every year. So multiple tools in the toolbox when it comes to that. Um, you mentioned soil pH and how you tried to correct that with, you know, different inputs, you know, I'm assuming lime and things like that. And I'm wondering, and, and uh, Barry asked the same question here, you know, what was your soil pH when you started? What is it now? And, you know, you you said you it's kind of come into balance as you've increased your soil organic matter. Well, we had a pH problem uh, in the sense that every soil test came back that said we had to apply lime and manage our our pH, which we tried to do. But my attitude is those are very short-term band-aids. And quite frankly, the only way to really balance that pH is through soil organic matter. And that stabilizes it because it, it holds uh, so much of that nitrogen. The storage of nitrogen that that SOM gives you is tremendous. So it kind of it's kind of went away. You know, we don't have the problem. So, so how low was it when you kind of first started this program? It was all over the board. It was all over the board. I mean, every one of our four or five fields, you know, some was high, some was low. Next year it would change. It would, it would get out of control. So I was constantly uh, having to put these Band-Aids on it. And now we don't, in fact, quite frankly, we don't even, we kind of ignore it anymore. It's stabilized. That, 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 that's a good feeling. <laughs> Just not even worry about that. And, and yeah, you're exactly right. You know, whether you're high or whether you're low, in a high carbon environment, which, you know, carbon is, you know, soil organic matter is about 58% carbon. So when you have that carbon in the soil, it, it just stabilizes things and the microbes are able to create uh, the pH that they need to or that they want to in their little micro environment. So you're exactly right. And the other thing is, because I know on our own ground here in Nebraska, you know, we always struggle with low pH. Well, one of the things that lowers pH is using a lot of nitrogen fertilizer. That That yes. is a very good way to lower your pH. And so then you're always having to offset that by putting lime on. And so as you have been able to switch over to being far less dependent on any added nitrogen, which sounds like now there's you know very little, if any, uh, you, you know, your pHs aren't bouncing all over the place because of that as well. Exactly. Yeah, so... Uh, that great question on that, Barry. Hopefully that answers that uh, question. Um, a question here on how are you planting the triticale? Um, and I think we kind of answered this. It's going in after you graze a cover crop. No, be a no-till drilled, right? And what approximately what part of the year are you doing that in September, October? Well, we don't like to do it in late September because you run the risk of army worms. And of course, on the other hand, you know, I want to get that in as early as possible so I can graze as early as possible. So that gets back to that clan grass. You know, so the trade-off, do I want to run the risk of army worms uh, versus getting it out? But generally, I like the first week of October. We've got a Great Plains so 2600 no-till, and I plant about three quarters of an inch to an inch. Uh, and I plant about two, 2.1, 2.2 bushels per acre, triticately. Okay. Okay. And, and then, you know, so that's, you're getting that in first of October. Are you able to start grazing that then like in April probably, or when are you turning out? Oh, no. Uh, we, well, of course, given good rains, 
Uh, we would like to be in there by Thanksgiving. Oh, okay. So you're yeah. you're all grazing that. Yes. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. We want to move in there as quick as we can because, again, back to that cost of gain. You know, the, my cost of gain uh, in walleye habials calves in a feedlot is a buck ten, buck twenty. So that's too much, you know. I, so forty five days, I really need to get that calf out of the feedlot. If I can put that calf in the fall on triticale, we do. If I can't, I'll run them on that interim clang grass because we try to save that clang grass as that transition based on what our rains are looking like in October on that triticale seed. Yeah, so you've got multiple options there to... Yeah, I've got a multiple yeah. option, but on the negative side, I got to get them out of that feedlot because that cost of gain, I, I don't want to live with. Mm, yeah. Yeah, I'm, you know, I'm just used to, again, up to our climate up here in Nebraska. You know, we just run out of growing degree days. What, what's your typical first frost date down there? November 4th. November 4th, okay. Yes. So, so you're getting your triticale in five to six weeks ahead of the normal first frost dates. So you're getting a good jump on it before. Well, that's you did hit the problem. You've got to get a good jump before that first frost. Uh, because quite frankly, it's going to be the latter part of February before it starts growing again. So that's your trade-off on army worms. You know, one year I went in early and got wiped out by army worms. So that's no fun. So we try to kind of compromise and get enough growth prior to that frost where we can get grazing. Because that's a small window. Yeah. Yeah. And that's where, you know, you just got to be set up and ready to go so when that window opens up right you're 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 ready to go on it there yeah. um, barry is also asking the question here and again i think we've kind of talked about this mostly pretty much all no-till do you ever have to do any type of tillage at all to kind of smooth things up you know from you know, hook traffic or anything like that or do you feel like your great plains drill is able to just kind of move through there and do it yeah we we don't we don't uh... And we don't have any tillage. Now you're right in the sense that cattle paths, when you got 500 cows in there, uh, and we also, by the way, in the summertime, we'll turn out dry calves or old cows, so we'll have more. Uh, you're right. I mean, sometimes their trails throughout the year can put a pretty good uh, rut through those fields, but we just do the best we can. Yeah. We're no till, no till meaning none, zero. Um, I mean, you know, to me, no-till causes too much damage on the soil structure, so we just don't want to do it, period. The, the tillage does, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, again, just give us the context of your area. Is that pretty rare? Do you know most of the guys that are doing one crop a year and doing a lot of tillage to do that one crop, or what does that look like in the in the neighborhood? Well, I, I'm in both young in Archer County, Texas. <clears throat> uh, and I would say that I know of virtually no rancher in my two counties that use cover crops. There are some use no-till, but they don't use cover crops. Now in the next county over, I do know one rancher that is no-till uh, and has a operation similar to mine. So it's almost unheard of. Uh, my, my neighbors don't agree uh, with my no-till program. Uh, and then quite frankly, some of them think I'm crazy. I mean, it's, they it just, wow. you know, and, and I think it gets down to, you know, I, I was born and raised in Illinois. So I've been in good soil uh, all my young life. And as you mentioned, to come down here and get these soil results in Archer County, Texas, is unheard of. And I'm, you know, when Haney get the results, I call them and say, "Are you sure these are mine and not somebody in Nebraska?" You know, because it's unheard of. Uh, but we don't have enough soil science in our farmers and ranchers today, and and I didn't have it either. You know, I couldn't have told you about the seven kinds of bacteria and microbial activity. But thanks to YouTube, there's about 7,250 things on YouTube <laughs> that you can get out there and learn. And I, I listen to those things, you know, five and 10 a week uh, because we've got to have better stewards. We've got to have uh, more soil science, just like genetics and cattle. You know, people 
uh, I didn't understand genetics. I didn't know what a terminal EPD was. <clears throat> and, and now I've studied those things and organizations like the Charlay organization in, in America, um, Kansas City, they've got a plethora of database on genetic values. Genetics works. Soil science works, period. Yeah. Yeah, I love your comment about YouTube there. I, I just was looking at our YouTube channel yesterday and I saw that we had 365 videos posted there. So when we put yours up there, uh, Max, you'll be 366. And so now people can watch one a day for a whole leap year. And, uh, but yeah, there's a tremendous amount of resources out there uh, for anyone who's willing to put the time in to learn. And, and you're right, you know, looking at those numbers, I, you know, we would love to have those numbers and we consider ourselves, you know, good farmers and, you know, to have a respirator or the, to have the uh, soil health score over 30 is incredible. And that respiration over 400, uh, it just shows that you've got a tremendous amount of biological activity happening there, which is really what changes the game. Now they can't live without having a living plant and you're keeping, you know, so, so the soil health principles, you're keeping the living root in the soil as much as possible you're keeping the soil covered, you're minimizing the disturbance, you know, you're maximizing that diversity because your mix, I'm looking at your mix here that we sent you, you know, it's, there's 12 different things in it, you know, mung beans, cowpeas, forage sorghum, sorghum sedan, brown top millet, pearl millet, oats, forage collards, radishes, buckwheat, sunflower, and okra, you know, so you've got, you've got, you know, six different plant families, you've got all kinds of diversity out there, your, your other crop, the triticale, doesn't have a lot of diversity, but it's partially by design. So you can do some uh, targeted herbicides if you have to, but you've got that big punch of diversity coming in every year. And that's really keeping your biological diversity really ramped up there. Have, have you done any biological soil tests like a PLFA or anything like that to just get a feel for where you're at from the actual critters in the soil? No, but if you'll send me an email, we'll get her done. <laughs> well, that that would I, I'm, be... all, I'm all for testing. Uh, you know, we we had too simplistic testing because I didn't understand the microbial the importance of the, the monitoring and measuring the microbial levels. Uh, so you know when uh, when we went to Haney, we learned that you've got to have a more advanced uh, structure for metrics, and that has really helped us. So I'm open to that, and thank you for helping me know that I need one more. We'll yeah, I will. And the other thing I'll send you, Max, is we we got a deal started with Ward Labs this year where uh, we want to get people like you who are doing these summer cover crops to send in a forage clipping of, of your cover crop kind of at maximum growth. They're going to run it through their, their cover crop nutrient test, and it will return about 12 different nutrients, 12 different minerals, and it will show you the level of, of nutrients in uh, the cover crop mix. And then you can kind of look at, okay, well, we know that this is cycling back through the system. Uh, so I'll send you that as well. We're, we're doing a project with Ward where we're getting a discount on it. So we're giving you the free test. All you got to do is clip it and send it in, and then we'll talk about the results. Uh, so if anybody else is interested in that, just let us know. Uh, but I think that's going to be really interesting to see, you know, the massive amount of nutrients that a good, healthy ecosystem cycles, because it's, it's, and it's not just the plants and it's not just the biology, it's the two of them working together that make it work and make it cycle. And you, you talked about magic, you know, you talked about, you know, August is when the magic of cover crops happen. And I think that magic only happens when you have that diversity of cover crops paired with the diversity of the biology. And uh, you obviously have, have both going there. Um, another question here that somebody's asking is, has the army worm pressure declined any with the improvements in soil organic matter or cover crop usage, or are, is that still something you fight every year? Well, depending on the temperature of that time of year, uh, army worms every year is a problem in our area. Uh, you know, I typically try to wait until it cools off just a little bit, uh, because when you're out there sitting on that, uh, you know, sitting on that drill at a 95 degree temperature, 
uh, that's just an invitation for army worms. So we typically wait it out. But as I pointed out, the trade-off is you you may be losing a week or two growth and that, having that uh, window narrow on you. So it's a trade-off. But on the other hand, I've seen, uh, not mine, but I've seen neighbors' fields literally get wiped out overnight with army worms. You know, I'm talking about one night. You know, there was there was wheat there on Thursday, and on Friday it was a bare field. So it can be massive problems. Yeah, and and they and that's difficult to really control with just good soil health practices because they're migratory. They move in and out, and so it's not yes. it's not just what you're doing on your soil. It's it's just those migratory patterns and so you can build some resilience but you're you really can't you know eliminate that as a threat yeah. because you don't have control over it yeah and and so most guys in your area they're planting probably just graze out wheat once a year are they planting kind of that same time frame or are they trying to get planted earlier because that's the only crop they're growing for the whole year well so many of my neighbors buy their calves uh, rather than have a cow calf operation. <clears throat> so they try to sow very early. We're, we're always one of the later ones to sow. And of course, they're out there running at risk on army worms, trying to get that growth. Uh, some of our neighbors buy Mexican cattle. So they come in uh, you know, thin. They need to be fed. Uh, can't put them on the feedlot because of cost of gain. So they're trying to get out, get out there on, um, on grazing. Yeah. And, and again, when you're only doing that one crop a year, then you've got to try to maximize that. So yes, yeah, I really like the theory of two crops every year, two calving seasons, and you're just really spreading that out. And your, your neighbors may think you're crazy, uh, but I, I think you're being crazy all the way to the bank. <laughs> but see, early, early on, uh, we didn't have that Klein grass. Uh, we just had cover crop and triticale, but I got caught with my pants down two or three times where we didn't have enough rain and I just plain run out of groceries because my triticale wasn't ready and our cover, our cover crop was already uh, grazed out. So that's the reason that we then put a field in and we put it in 100% Klein grass. And of course, we're on the edge of the Klein grass territory, meaning a little bit north of us, you run the risk of freeze out. Uh, but Klein grass has been a fantastic backup for us. Yeah. So, so do you have any neighbors at all that are coming to you and saying, Gosh, how are you getting so much productivity? I'd like to know more about what you're doing. Or are they just kind of hunkering down and doing their own thing? Well, every once in a while, I'll have a neighbor come and say, hey, we're kind of intrigued. Uh, what was your capital cost to buy a sprayer and to buy a no-till drill? And then, you know, once you tell them the capital you got tied up in that, the conversation's kind of over. You know, they just don't want to make that shift because admittedly, uh, you know, sprayers are expensive to get a good one. Uh, you got to get a good size one to get productivity. Uh, no-till drills are expensive. Uh, so it's, yeah. it's not, but, it's the capital thing that I think stops yeah. them. But tillage equipment and all that stuff isn't cheap either. I mean, you don't, you don't have any investment in any of that kind of stuff too. So, you know, one of the, and, and, and the, the dynamics between neighbors is, it's just really fascinating. And if you, if folks, if you get a chance and when we do the recording on this on, on YouTube, we can put a link here. Peter Beck has a series called Roots So Deep. It's a four-part series where they interview regenerative farmers, regenerative grazers, much like what Max is doing, and then a neighbor, a direct neighbor, uh, who they have a good relationship with, but is not doing these practices. And they just, they really document the struggle that neighbors sometimes have in asking questions and getting information. But it, it's, a, it's a very, very powerful film series. Uh, and I really recommend everybody watch that because it, it really opens your eyes, not only, and there's a ton of science, they bring in high level scientists to document how much better the regenerative practices are than what just regular ranching uh, grazing practices. But then they look at it from that social aspect as well, which I think is really fascinating. So Max, one more question. Tony popped one in here at the end. He says on that cover crop payback slide, you know, when you had the 673%, 
ROI. How, how many acres is that involving in that calculation? 640. 640 acres. Okay. So really not all that many for that, that number of, of cattle and that big of operation. So, well, we kind of hit our time limit here. Uh, Max, do you have any, you know, uh, parting pieces of advice for people that want to try to jump in and start something, you know, where, where it's kind of the low hanging fruit of where they should start? Well, if you're not a soil scientist, we need to be, be one. Uh, on the cattle side, if you're not a student of genetics, strive to be one uh, because those are two scientific, scientific fields. Uh, when a neighbor comes over, or you, you kind of point your finger down to the earth and you say, okay, what, what is it, what do you call that? And if he uses the word dirt, you know he's not a soil scientist. You stop using the word dirt when you become a soil scientist. So there's kind of the difference uh, that, that you can see with neighbors. Yeah. And we've got, it's a science world. Cattle is a science world. Genetics yeah. is a science world. Yeah. And we got to be better at it. And, and it's, really it's easy to do. Really important piece of equipment that you showed in one of your slides that takes almost no capital investment was you had a picture of your spade, your, your your shovel out there. And you don't have to go to a four-year school to be a soil scientist, but you got to be in the soil to study it. And that's a huge, huge uh, piece of it is get your shovel, carry it with you, dig down, see what those roots are doing. See what they're doing to the soil. Look at, you know, earthworm activity. Look at all these things because that's, that's how you learn. YouTube and a spade and <laughs> you'll be in good shape. We, when we started no-till, uh, Keith, uh, I had one of the folks from the Noble Foundation say, well, why don't you go out and uh, tell me how many earthworms you got? You know, with a hundred shovels full, we got no earthworms, none, zero. Uh, and now I typically get from two to four earthworms for every two or three shovels. So you're right. There's some simple ways you can do it. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's a simple way to take a, your torch and cut off a piece of four or six inch pipe and do your water filtration. You know, you're the ones that kind of got me into that. Yeah. Uh, there's there's some, some simple things you can do. Well, great advice, folks. Uh, you know, get out there, look at your soils, get on YouTube, learn as much as you can. Uh, we will be posting this to our YouTube library uh, here in the next week or so. So we encourage you to invite your friends uh, to watch this, uh, to get some good advice, and to join us um, next week as well, as we'll have another, I think we'll have an organic uh, dairy, a dairyman from uh, the East Coast, Eric Zion, uh, is going to be next in our Regenerative Livestock Series. So Max, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for taking the time to share your unique background and your thought process of how you're doing things there at your ranch in Loving, Texas. Thanks for joining, everybody. Take care.